Hi, everybody. My name is Jim Clark. Uh, I am a member of Docker Labs. We are working on innovation at, at Docker. Um, you probably saw some of, our, some of our talks today. We've been working on AI ML, Docker Debug. I've been doing some research over the past six months, I guess, on Nix. And I have to say, besides LLMs, which have been like a, an exciting and big part of our, uh, of our, of our work for the, last, for the last while, Nix has actually had a really big influence on the way I've been working, maybe one of the bigger influences uh, over, the, over the last year. So I'm kind of excited to look out and get an opportunity to see people who are either using Nix today or hopefully will be using uh, Nix tomorrow. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm a Nix enthusiast, but relatively new, just, just been using it in the last year. So I'm, I'm excited to have Tom. Uh, he is maybe not a Nix enthusiast. What would you call yourself? Uh, I think I'm more in the category of Nix fanatic. At this point, there's no going back. Um, but yeah, my name is Tom Bereckney. I'm the director of Labs at Flox, where we're trying to kind of figure out what this set of superpowers are and how do we bring them to the world? How do we figure out how to expose them, present them in a usable way? And uh, that's really our uh, mission. So I think uh, let's get started. OK, agenda. Um, I think it's going to be easiest to talk about where we are today. Because we're going to talk about content today. And so we build content for Docker using Docker images, Docker files. These are great. I obviously, um, I'll, I'll speak from the Docker file and Docker perspective in this talk. Um, they do, we're, we're going to admit some limitations to them. And I, I, I hopefully will, you'll, you'll see in our examples how you overcome some of these limitations today. I want to kind of impress upon you the idea that Nix is another option that we have here. This adopting a declarative approach and how we can use Docker and Nix together is the thing that we really want to, everybody to get out of, this, out of this talk today. And at the end, we've got a little bit of a call to action because there are some actually really interesting opportunities that we have to bring a new way of using both Docker and Nix together. And we're kind of like interested in what, whether, whether people want to join us on that. Yep, so the, the point here is to kind of get some interest and also then take that interest to momentum and go to the next steps. OK, so let's start with Docker files. That's where we are today. And uh, the, the, the picture that you'll all be familiar with here is our mental model of how we build content in images. So we have Docker files. Docker files produce layers. That relationship between an instruction and a layer is, is one to one. And we all think about this as a stack. You start, you start with your operating system. You start to you do things at the end of doing something. You take a snapshot, and you keep, you keep building these layers one by one until you've, you've got your entire image. So I kind of want to set this, ground, this groundwork because this is, where we're start, this is where we are right now. And we're going to start to kind of like look at how we might change that to get a few improvements to our, to our workflow. Yeah. It's important to note that this model, it works. It's simple. It gives you a good mental model. That mental model is, is actually somewhat accurate. And that means that it doesn't leak or cause problems very often. But there are some limitations. So let's talk about some of those. Right. So um, I, I'm not going to talk about like, why we like Docker files. We all like Docker files. It's a great way of getting, getting our content into, into, into our images. Um, what, what I'll talk a little bit about is how do we share them? And when you're, when you're thinking about a, the, a Docker file that you've made and is working great, how do you, how do you treat that like, a, like something like a library that you get to share with other people? How do you manage, or, or maybe I'll ask it this way, have you had, ever had the experience where you kind of know that you've maybe put a little bit too much into, into one of your Docker images? Um, Best practices. The, you, the first Docker file you write doesn't look a lot like the last Docker file you write. There is a journey there. And those best practices, when we, when we learn them, I mean, our images get better. We have an understanding of where you start, where you end. How do we encapsulate those best practices? And finally, um, supply chain considerations. Yeah, this is uh, a topic that's coming up more and more often. There's more interest in supply chain and S-bombs. And how do we do and how do we handle these things in a disciplined manner? How do we address all of these things? And that's 
pretty much the rest of the talk is going to be about. I don't know if bloat is the right word. Bloat is a, yeah, bloat is a good uh, is a is, is a good word here. Um, so everyone has the experience of where, how the content that you put in your Docker image is maybe not the content that you actually need to run. And sometimes that's because you need a lot of tools to build, and you don't need those tools when you run. But it's also another thing. There's a phenomenon of the easiest thing to do is just to get everything. I mean, it's a little bit like when you're packing for a holiday. The easiest thing to do is just throw everything in your suitcase. But there is actually a price to pay for that. And um, on a plane, it might be that it just doesn't fit. But in the, in the world of like content, there's also the problem of there's a bit of a tax if you've got content in that that you don't need, and let's just say that some of that content becomes vulnerable, you might have work to do. And so there isn't it, it, the, the ability to kind of like obsess a little bit over only having the smallest amount of content that you need, sometimes that obsession provides, is, is, that's work for us. And what we're going to talk about today is a way that you can kind of build up to only having the content you need easily. So the, the, key, the key word here is easily. And that might make you think about multi-stage builds. Is that not the problem it solves? And in some sense, uh, it might. I, yeah, it is, right? I mean, multi-stage builds are a great way of, of handling this. You, you've, you've got one stage to build up your build graph. This is everything that you need in order to build your content. And then what do you do? You copy out the minimal amount that you need into, into your runtime. And that sentence, copy out the minimal amount that you need, how do you do that? Like, what does that even mean to go to, to take the content that you need from your build and move it? You have to understand how to do that. That, is, that, that itself is a kind of a piece of knowledge that you need. Yeah, this, this requires expertise. You need to know what you need to pull out of it. Uh, sometimes if you have a larger and more complex project, you're going to have dynamic libraries. You're going to have things loaded only at runtime. You're going to have scripting languages for which this is a very non-trivial problem, right? If you can static build everything, right, it's relatively simple. But as soon as you start having a more complex piece of software, uh, now you don't know, did I grab too much? Did I grab too little? Uh, are the errors I'm going to run into only going to show up in production because those code pads only show up there, and I don't have a way to verify, did I get everything I needed? And sometimes fixing this is easy, sometimes it's hard, but it always, if you tend to try to like, hope for the best, it always tends to bite you, and it tends to bite you at the worst possible moment. So how do we make it so that we actually know up front whether or not we have everything that we need? So for, for modularity, the way I like to think about it is, as developers, how do we approach modularity? When you have something that you want to reuse, you put it in a library, you package it up, you give people the Git coordinate for it, and you share it. And in some ways, when we've figured out how to, do, uh, to, to package our, our image, why don't we use a similar sort of technique? And so one of the, one of the things that we're going to try to impress upon you today is that we actually can do something very similar in this sphere. Yeah, and this is just kind of an example of showing that I want to bring in wisdom from two different sources. Maybe it's a best practice, maybe it's a company policy, maybe it's how my particular language ecosystem is supposed to work, but I want to bring those in and use all those pieces of wisdom at once. But notice how this kind of looks like there's kind of two things that I need to inherit from, right? Not one. It starts to look not like that st stack or that list that we looked at before, but it starts to look more like using libraries. It starts to look like the sort of read use and modularity that developers are often familiar with. So, but how do we do this? How do we do this in a, in a structured manner? How do we do this again in a way that uh, imposes like the correct controls that we want? So this is a, this is a slide I like. Um, maybe it's a little bit too uh, abstract, but I like to think about what is Docker build. Um, what is the, the Docker file? It's a way for us, it's a, it's, it's a function that we can run where the output is, the output are layers of content. And what are the inputs to that function? So if you squint at a, at a Docker file, you realize, okay, it, this, this defines my function. The inputs are things like from lines, what content where, where am I starting with? Um, 
statements like copies when I want to copy something from a multi-stage build, or in the or just a run line where I might you know grab some content from the internet where I guess the uh, input to my function is uh, the internet. So learning how the, how we can control those inputs so that we can consistent so that we have consistent verifiable outputs that's one of the that's one of the big things that we're going to be uh, addressing in the next section yeah when you contact the internet right anything can happen and it also means that now like all your efforts to try to control what went into your software goes a little bit haywire right what did you just put into your software it could be something that you need, something that you don't need. It might have been changed along the way. Right? How do you verify this? Right? So every time you do, go do this uncontrolled access, either to a build context or to the internet, or just do something that kind of breaks out and tries to pull these things in, it's very pragmatic. Right? It's very useful. But now we've kind of thrown a lot of the control and the repeatability. Right? There's all these kind of words we keep using about how do I go back in time? How do I debug? How do I figure out whether or not, OK, it worked for you, but not worked for me? Like, we end up with this problem of works on my machine and not yours, even in the context of containers as I try to build the one that you did. So we have a, we have a problem to solve here. So for me, this is one of the things that really made Nix kind of an, an important part of my, my tool chain. Because for a C, I, I've, I know enough about Docker files that I can be very confident that I'm keeping my CI in my production environments in sync. But there was a point where I started to realize that my development environments, I wasn't really even trying to keep them in sync with my, my CI and production environments. That, that moment when I ask everyone on the team, hey, we're, we're, we're deploying this version, we're using this version of NPM, uh, what, what, what are people on in their local environments? And you know, people list a whole bunch of, it's just entropy. Like there's nothing, if there's nothing, if there's no common definition that's keeping those in sync, then they have a tendency to, to get out of sync. And this, is, this was really interesting that I was able to like, start looking at a, a development environment and end up using that same definition to drive my uh, Docker environment. I mean, what we want here is we want all these things to like, operate in the same way, in the same predictable manner. And how do we do so? Well, how about we try to set a standard, like, hey, try to run the same bits everywhere. That's a good way to at least get started. Maybe you know, some configuration might be different, but let's just run the same stuff and have a commonality of behavior, a commonality of outcomes, so that you don't have a, well, this is a bug in prod, but not in CI, or it's a bug locally, but not anywhere else. Right? These discrepancies are what slows us down as developers. It slows down that inner loop. So that's kind of like a, a description of the problem. Um, now let's get a in a little bit into what, what some of the solutions might look like. So uh, about a decade ago, came across this thing uh, called Nix. And one of its uh, kind of early phrases that's in the original thesis is that uh, Nix is about getting computer programs from one machine to another and having them still work when they get there. I think that's a, that's a statement we can all agree we want. I mean, that's essentially the mission statement, I'd say, of most people writing software. You don't just write software for yourself. You write software so that other people can run it or that it can be useful for other people as well. We don't just kind of look internally. We want to be able to push things out and have reuse. We want to be able to distribute our services and scale them. Right? This, is what, this is something that we want to do. And uh, this is something that like, Nix does. Right? And this is uh, uh, something that we've been doing since about 2003. Right? We got a whole bunch of packages. We focus a lot on correctness and provenance and reproducibility. We incorporate a lot of these best practices that we talk about. We incorporate them very early in a very like disciplined manner. You know, sometimes so disciplined that it might be a little painful. It's kind of like eating your vegetables, but we make sure you do it. Um, that also comes with a, a bit of a learning curve, right? This is something that like, Flox is working on. We're trying to make that adoption process easier. So you know, keep an eye out for that work. Uh, upstream, I'm also part of the Nix maintainer group. That's also part of trying to make this whole effort better to make it usable. But we want to have declarative of framework, right? That's what we want to be able to leverage. And the last piece of this is like, yeah, there's also like a perception problem about this ecosystem. So part of this talk is to try to kind of talk about that perception problem and see what we could do to, to fix this. Because there are some changes here. And we want to also expose that like there is real use behind this. You know, for example, yesterday's keynote was talking about the uh, Docker debugger extension. 
that's using Nix under the hood as well. Like you're starting to see a lot more people take advantage of this. And we have a, a blog series pointing this out. So I just want to kind of highlight that these are the sorts of things we're working on. Yeah, and ultimately, like, Docker is also a tool for moving software from one place to another. And so what we're, and, and it's actually pretty frequent for people to think about Docker versus Nix. Like there, there's a, it, the, you, if that's the, that's the thing that you're going to see if you search online, like, do I use Docker or do I use Nix? And what we're talking about here is Docker and Nix. A couple of the, a couple of the reasons is that, well, I mean, they, they are distinct in some ways. Docker is a container runtime. Nix is container agnostic. Nix has a package repository. Docker is package agnostic. And although they're, they're, there are ways where we have to admit, I mean, there's a lot of overlap here. Like, they both deal with the problem of in install conflicts. They're, they both have their own ways of, of looking at isolation. But they are, it turns out that, that when, you, when you look at this, you'll, you, I think, or at least what, we're, what we're, we're trying to experiment with here, is that they're very complementary approaches. And so that's what, that's what we're going to get into next. Yeah, a lot of what we're trying to figure out is how do we leverage those strengths of both and how do we integrate them well so that it kind of meets the needs of users. So um, I, I don't know if this helps you, but this helped me on my journey to kind of understand that. We've got this thing called the file hierarchy standard, FHS, and really that's a way of discovering programs. And it's kind of saying, hey, if, if you're looking for a lib, where should you go? Look in user lib. If you're looking for a bin, look in bin. If, uh, and the, the thing about, uh, about Nix, or the thing about, like, about standards like that, is what if you have, say, a program like Node, and you have two versions. You're, in one project, you want to use one version. In another product, project, you want to use another one. They conflict. Like, who gets to be user local bin Node on your machine? And Docker has a solution for that. You isolate runtimes. Every runtime gets to make his own choice. Nix also has a solution for that. Throw away the file hierarchy standard. I never really thought you could throw away the file hierarchy standard. Every time I've used Linux, it's been there. I thought, I thought it came, I, th I just thought it was the 11th commandment. Well, there, and there, you, you can use that, but uh, and there are conventions there that are very useful. But if we're trying to solve this problem of having software work no matter where it goes, you can't have conflicts. Mm. Right? And this idea of conflicts, once you have no conflicts between different packages or different uh, runtimes or different programs, different libraries, you start to expose some interesting possibilities. Yeah, and also a personal story here. I thought that that was going to blow my workflow completely out of the water. The idea that my path environment wouldn't have like user bins and user local bins, I was like, well, that's just not going to work. And it's one of the few things, like, it's one of the things I didn't notice. Like, it, as I moved to Nix, I never noticed that I didn't have anything in user bin anymore. So I, my prediction was that this was going to be a huge change. And in fact, it turned out to be an unnoticeable change. That was a, a surprise to me. Yep. Um, so the other mental shift <clears throat> that you're going to have to make in order to, in order to understand this is there is a transition here from layers to graphs. So as we said earlier a couple slides ago, when you do a Docker build, you are running a set of instructions and producing a, producing a set of layers. When you're doing a Nix build, you are full on producing a graph. They, they are, they're, there's just a very different underlying construct. Is this a problem? Well. <laughs> well, it's also closer to what a developer normally does when you start to compose code, right? That modularity question from the beginning, right? You want to grab all these, like, buckets of wisdom, snippets of wisdom, right? The error issues that someone has fixed upstream, some libraries, something that's reusable, you grab it from here, there, and everywhere. Maybe it's something that my organization puts out as a policy. Maybe it's something that upstream does. Maybe it's something, some other library that I wrote, some other department wrote, right? And you want to pull all these pieces in, and again, this looks far more like the standard programming model of, hey, I pull in libraries that are useful to me, that are necessary. 
right? We're just kind of taking that similar model rather than only saying, hey, this library can only be stacked under this library and that one, right? I pull the ones in that I need that brings in the wisdom and functionality that I need encoded in those locations. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think in terms of stacks, like every so often I look at a, 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 thing, a set of layers and it like makes this model in my head, I go, oh yeah, that's the stack that I'm running on. But when I think about the actual program, I often think about the dependency graph. That, that supports that. So I, I sort of feel like I, I in, in practice, think of, think of this in two different ways, and they both have their uses. Yeah. All right, and how do we manage this graph, right? This graph is obviously more complicated than a set of layers. And so uh, one thing that we are looking at is, well, hey, we talked about that multi-stage build, right? How do we take that graph, the set of things that you have, and then carve out of it the, only the things you need at runtime? Because very often, the context you need at build time is far bigger. Right? And I want to pull that out, copy that out, and that's essentially the beginnings of exactly that best practice of don't bring all your build environment with you into prod. Right? Just bring what you need for runtime. Right. And is this, and one question here is that how hard is this? So when we, when we decide to do a build, our tool constructs a build graph for us. When we decide to copy a runtime over, how easy is it for us to, to ask our tools to go give me the smallest graph that I need so that I can copy it over there. Is that an easy thing or is that a hard thing? And that's one of the things that Nix provides is basically you get this for free, right? That's one, you know, one outcome that you get. And this leads to something interesting. Uh, so because we have that kind of bookkeeping of all those inputs, right, the inputs that function of input and out, because you do really good bookkeeping of that, and then because you give all of those things really precise names, right? Those names are going to be basically including the hash of all the things that it took to create them. Now we've got naming, which allows me to do caching, right? Those, two, those are two of the CS problems uh, that we have, right? The last one's off by one errors. But now that we've solved them, now you get a really powerful capability where we can start to pull in uh, caching behavior where otherwise it was either difficult to do or I can share with a team, or I can share with an organization, and to do so safely, right? Caching and validation is always an issue. But if that is no longer a problem, what are the possibilities? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, back to this abstraction at the bottom here, if I know the inputs, and the inputs don't change, and I get the same output, I have a strategy for, what, for how caching should be. And this is like, in some ways, the, the fact that Nix is constantly pushing me to, to, to define this is one of the things that I like the best about it and kind of one of the things that is sort of like the hardest. So earlier when I said it was really easy to get used to not having the FHS standard, it's actually really hard to get used to the fact that Nix is constantly pushing me to really be clear about what my inputs are because I've gotten lazy. And in fact, sometimes I think I know what my inputs are, and then I actually do the build, and I go, I did not know what my inputs were. And it's, so it's, it's putting that front and center, and in the end, I mean, I'm getting some, I'm, I, I get somewhere where I've, I have isolated this, but it's like running this little experiment over and over again, making sure that my, in, my inputs are producing the, the, this output reliably and, and consistently, and I'm doing that at build time, and I'm doing that continuously. And, and why do we do this, right? Because I have often found if you don't do something like this, you will inevitably pay for it. It might speed something up day one, but day 10, day 100, you will end up paying for if there's something that you didn't track, you didn't know that you depended on something. There was some remote resource, some service, some random like you know corporate resource that you needed to access, and if you didn't track it, you didn't know that it was there, it almost always comes back to bite you. And so uh, dealing with it up front is an investment, again, but it's worthwhile. Okay, so here's what we, what we did in order to try to like bridge these two worlds and make it really easy to start with Nix and have a, a, a path towards building, uh, working in the Docker ecosystem with it. Um, so I'm going to explain this, this approach. And just want to highlight that one of the things we tried to do with this is just use Dockerfile best practices. So we went, we went through and we, we made sure that we are looking at build contexts appropriately, running with doc, Docker ignores, using multi-stage builds, having like very carefully crafted run statements. And we've come up with a, a, a Dockerfile that represents these, these best practices and, um, and uses Nix. 
And this Docker file supports a bunch of applications, and uh, we, we, we've, we've got sample applications that we can, we can uh, let everyone look at. We tried to have a fairly diverse set of tech stacks here, and we also tried to use a diverse set of different package ecosystems to make sure that what we're trying to do here is actually you know, working across a, a diverse set of applications. So let me explain a little bit what the, what the shim actually, actually does. And one of the highlights, or one of the, the things that's interesting about it is we've stopped using base images. So of course, we bootstrap the process um, at, the, at, there, at the beginning. But going back to that idea of, using, of building the graph, once we've built the graph, we just copy that over into our final image. And the final image is always Scratch. So you don't see, so th this, particular, this particular methodology doesn't actually use base images. The build itself starts by computing what is the build time graph that you need and pulls that in. Step two, it runs the build. Step three, it computes a minimal runtime graph. And step four, it constructs an SBOM from that graph. So it, it constructs that. It, it looks at the runtime that you've built and the build time and records all of the packages that, that have gone in as, a, as an SBOM. So if we take a, take a look at that, break that down a little bit, this is kind of the most interesting statement in the, the if, oh yeah, the, this, is, this is kind of the most interesting statement in this whole Docker file because the highlight here is that the Nix is a graph database. And so what I do right at the end of the build is I query that graph database for my runtime. And that's all I'm doing right there, is I'm, I'm, asking, I'm asking Nix for the minimal runtime so that I have that and I can copy it to the next, to the next stage. So that, that answer to the question, is this easy? It is easy. It doesn't have, it doesn't have any language specific, technology specific, or package ecosystem specific work in it. It's just one line and it's always the same because, again, we're letting, it, we're letting the software do the work here. Nix is, 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 is already a graph database, so let's just query it. You have something there that's doing the bookkeeping for you, right? That bookkeeping helps you do this safely, so again, it tracks it, you don't have to track it. Humans are really bad at keeping track of what you need, what you don't need, how to allocate it, how to deallocate it, uh, whether those references are still alive or dead. It doesn't sound like something humans tend to be good at. In fact, those are the things that tend to lead towards vulnerabilities. This next line um, generates an SBOM from that runtime graph. Um, so we, we want to make that as declarative as possible. And uh, finally, we copy the contents into, into, our, into our final image. Um, that's probably pretty obvious. I want to highlight that, like, let's make sure that we're using BuildKit appropriately here. Let's make sure we're using Docker appropriately. So let's always set up our cache mounting correctly so that our, our builds, this is going to be a 95% speed up on, on any time you do more than one build. Um, we also are, in the next line, we're setting up to use your build context appropriately. Often you don't know whether your build context can be read-only. With Nix, your build context would 100% of the time be, be read-only. Um, so this is always safe to do. Notice there's, never, there's no copy statements build it, copying your source code into this, into this build stage. We just mount the build context directly. And finally, it's kind of an, an interesting thing that Nix, like we said, it's insanely cacheable so that we, we can set this up so that our private packages are always shared in a local network. So if you're two people are doing the same build with the same inputs and someone's already done it, you can grab it. This cache is, this cache is meant to be something simple like an S3 bucket or SSH or something like that. Yep. Um, and I think like the important thing about this, this idea is it's just regular Docker build. So we're not changing anything here. You just run, you just run a Docker file with Docker build. Um, if you want to store your SBOM attestations, maybe you have a few extra build kit flags there to store, to store that attestation. And just a little like, hint towards what we're, what we're kind of looking at here. Um, if, you're, if the Docker file is always the same for every project, then maybe we just don't pass it. <laughs> 
Maybe we just put that right into Docker. And with better build kit and Nix integration, right, you can actually make these things so that you don't have to repeat yourself so much. You can inherit those wisdom wherever it comes. Um, there was a talk earlier today about exactly this same thing. And so we think this is a rich ecosystem here where we can figure out what is the best way to incorporate this and right, uh, end up with results that we want. OK, so some results. Um, build time versus runtime graph. The Ideally here, what you're going to see is that there, when, you, when you have a, a large build time and a small runtime, you're going to see a big difference in your final images. And so we just wanted to go through a couple like standard apps and just show you the difference between how many packages, that's the, that's the, the blue line or the, the line that tends to be long, how many packages are in your build time and are necessary to do that, and how many in your, are in, in your runtime? And this is all; these are all reductions in packages that you just sort of get for free. This just this just sort of like pops out of using this pattern. Yep. And so we can dig into a few other examples where, hey, for a Node application, something is now you know smaller. We have smaller packages, right? There's less stuff now to audit. There's less stuff to keep track of. That tends to be a good thing, right? There's less, perhaps less paperwork I got to do, less compliance I have to do, right? Less times I have to be aware of like false alarms, and we're not paying like a huge cost for this, right? In fact, this is a huge benefit. It gets rid of the the sort of tedious work I don't want to do. Another example here is in the GoLang world. Okay, again, we can start to trim out these containers and we can make them smaller. Uh, rebuild time on this one kind of suffered a little bit, but these are things that we're working on, right? Um, Flux is trying to figure this out on how do I correctly reuse the Go, Go, Go mod cache in a way to make it that uh, we get the same or better rebuild times. Take a look at the packages, right? Go is famous for you know, compiling down all your, everything into one thing. Well, and that's awesome. Like, we, we need this, and let's actually get rid of all the other things in your containers that you don't need. Um, so that comes up often. And think about how many uh, false alarms on those other uh, 209 packages you're going to have to deal with when some, uh, you know, some security tool says, hey, you have a problem there. You're like, we're not using it. It's not in the runtime. Well, the tool doesn't know that, right? Or maybe it might guess that it is or it might guess that it's not. But the best way to take care of that is just remove it. Uh, here's a uh, Python, right? Again, uh, digging out a Python application out of that build time environment is a, often a very risky proposition. Imagine doing that for free, right? Here, if that baseline image has you know, 64 pieces of paperwork I got to figure out to kind of get my compliance, all right, now I'll only have two. I've probably saved myself a lot of time. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've, we've kind of, looked at this transition from layers to graphs. Um, I think one interesting thing to, th to think about is what if every package was a layer? Yeah, packages and layers, right? We saw earlier uh, Docker Scout went into this of trying to tell like when did a package show up or when did a piece of software show up? Well, let's kind of make this relationship a little bit closer. Layers and packages are kind of are trying to do the same thing. And amazingly, under the hood, in Docker itself, uh, layers are independent. Like in containers, right, these are just content addressed like blobs. And they're independent of each other, except the only way you can often use them is by layering them, one under the other. And if we actually understand that each of these layers are independent, right, they're not going to conflict with each other, we open up a lot of interesting possibilities. Right? We now no longer maybe have, uh, no longer have that layer limitation. We don't have to use overlay effects. We can bind mount things. We can do things faster and in parallel. We can get better sharing and reuse because now I can push these around because they're conflict free. I don't have to be so methodically putting A, B, C, D. I could just get everything all at once and bring them all in in any order I see fit, again, because they're conflict free. Yeah, I sort of think about it as you've sort of changed the rules of the game a little bit because ultimately the we, we have to think about layers in terms of order because one layer can always delete something and you have to apply them like that. What, what happens if that's impossible? If all of your, if all of your packages are fundamentally conflict free, you've just kind of changed the nature of how, of the optimization. You've changed the rules of the game. Absolutely. All right. We're going to a little bit of uh, demo to showcase like what this is. Um, so first off, we're going to talk about this, uh, this shim, that Docker file that encodes the best practices for us. All right, let's uh, get this figured out. All 
All right, so here we have an example. This is one of uh, uh, Docker's repos, and cool. We're going to uh, try to uh, run this thing. Using buildkit, it loads the context that it needs, applies those best practices, it runs it. In this case, looks like, well, it was cached already, which is an awesome thing, and now I don't have to worry about this. So the application of the best practices was just done for me. If we take a look at like what this looks like, it's basically the each line of these things encodes one of the documented Docker file best practices. So that's all we're just trying to showcase here that this thing, uh, it works, it works today, and uh, it's in use. Yeah, awesome. All right, uh, next thing I was going to showcase is uh, a little bit of, I want to talk about uh, some of these graphs, some of these things that we can, uh, you know, talk about. And let's uh, clear this out. So let's say I got some kind of random project. All right, we're Project Raccoon. I want to figure out uh, what I'm doing. And we really, really like uh, something called Kause. Except uh, I don't have it anymore. I don't have it right now. That, that kind of sucks. That's, that's annoying. And maybe you have a different one, and I have a different one, and it requires all sorts of Perl things, and I don't even know Perl, so how do I get CPAN set up? Eh, that's annoying. Well, what if I just kind of had this stuff as soon as I enter, uh, let's say, Project Bunny? I want to go into Project Bunny. We have a very kind of uh, critical uh, thing we want to do. We want Moby to say Bunny. Great. Well, do I have Kausei now? All right, cool. Now I have it. All right, but that's not Moby. So instead, we're going to do a whole bunch of programming, a whole bunch of uh, design iteration, and like product is going to have a say in all this. But eventually, we end up with being able to say, all right, cool. Now Moby says Bunny. I love that, and I get to move on with my life. Ah, no, I got to deploy this. I need to scale this. Th this has to be done 100,000 times all across the world. So instead, I now need to make sure this thing is containerized well. All right, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, loading this into Docker. Cool, I'm going to grab only the runtime portions. These are all these paths you saw kind of roll by here. I'm only going to grab that portion, not all the other portions of Perl or all the other libraries that I might have used for development or linting or debugging, because, I mean, debugging Perl, you need all sorts of other things. But now I have a container. And I run that container, boom. Now Moby says bunny. And now I could push this all over the globe, scale up infinitely, and uh, life is good and KPIs go up. All right, what happened now? Uh, let's kind of like dig into a little bit of what's going on. I'm going to try to kind of colorize a few things. All right, this is the list of packages that I needed, right? They're colored in green. That means this is stuff I needed at runtime. This is just your runtime. Yep, this is it. Now, obviously, because I'm running some complicated programming, it's all sorts of random stuff. But I need more when I do build. Well, what do I need during build? Well, it's going to be more things, right? I need all sorts of, uh, I don't know, debuggers and make and tools and gzip and I don't know, all sorts of random stuff has come in because, hey, developers, they like all their random tools. This is all needed for building. But I need more than this, right? When I want to do development, I need all this stuff. I need to build my software, but also need to develop my software. So there's a whole other set of things I might need, right? which here are going to be uh, in purple. Like, these are stuff I might need. I, I mean, I need C tags. I don't need that during build. I don't need that during runtime. I need that while I'm trying to traverse a code base. So you can see we have, like, all the stuff that you might need and how we kind of also can pull stuff out of that graph, pull the components out that are necessary for any one particular time, and turn that into something that's either minimal or constrained in some way so that I don't have to deal with this entire build graph I only have to deal with the portion that's needed for, let's say, development, or for the build, or for runtime. And that starts to trim things down. So back to our, our CI prod and, and dev, do we have like one common definition for these, or do, we, or do, we, do you think about how would you, how would you describe that? Uh, this is something that then it's one definition. Again, uh, it's one system, one definition that I get to use for development. I get to then have this. Uh, pop into existence right when I go into that project, right? If I'm in Project Bunny, then cool, I get access to all these tools. I go to Project Raccoon, then, uh-oh, they're on a different version. They're, let's say, using Python and not Perl, then someone else is going to be using a different set of tools. How do I make sure those things don't conflict? I need to be able to hopscotch between these projects, right, without fear. And we get this, right, um, this convergence of CI, prod, and, and development, Run the same bits everywhere, at least if you can, right? 
that, that's the best chance of success to be able to, have to uh, recreate the, the same scenarios in the same situations. So we talked about uh, going into projects, being able to get all the things that you need. Um, hey, these uh, containers that we're making, they're just normal containers, right? You can inspect them, you can look at them, uh, but they have this property where the layers are non-conflicting. Right now, we're not really leveraging that property to the full extent, and that goes into a little bit of like, well, what we want to do next, right? So our call to action here is, first off, consider using the shim. Consider using some of these tools, like Docker and Nix can work together very well. Who should do this? Hey, if you care about containers, anyone interested in some of these superpowers that you might have access to, take a look at this, and take a look at this now, right? We have examples that you can draw on. Come talk to us afterwards. I mean, what, what, I've, what, what I find is that most of you will probably come to Nix because you're trying to reproduce development environments or you're trying to like change the way you build up your own development environment. But once you have done that, I, we just want to kind of impress and sort of demystify the process of like that content you can also use to build your, your images as well. That's, I think that's the key here. Like, don't, don't think that, you, that you've just built a big difficulty for yourself in putting this stuff into, into images and, um, and, and using your CI processes. There is, there is like a very clear path to using Nix for your development environments and for your projects, and also then moving in and using, um, using it for your CI and, and production environments as well. Next up, um, we want better integration between BuildKit and Nix. So help us figure out exactly what that integration needs to be. How do we kind of upstream these things? How do we expose this to people? Um, and this, we need some of the developers, some of the people in this room, some people listening. We need to come together and figure out, like, how do we do this well? What creates a good user experience? And uh, so again, like, raise issues in the, in the BuildKit project. Come contact us. Uh, I think there are some exciting possibilities that uh, we can start to uh, take, take advantage of. Awesome. And we really have been experimenting with, with some of these runtimes too. And it's, it's kind of wild to see your ability to spin up runtimes in say like a custom container D environment that, we are, that we're playing around with and, and really see that suddenly we've got a, a few new options. And I mean, it's not the, like my appreciation of this is has, has been kind of like a slow evolution. I definitely started with like, I love what this does to my dev environments, but now I'm also starting to go, hi, there, there, are, there are some really interesting properties to this that are improving my runtime as well. And I, I just know so much more about what has gone into my image. Yeah, and then some of these issues, like some of these performance benefits, some of the scaling benefits and storage benefits really come into play once you start getting to big enterprises, right? If it's, a, you know, if it's just you alone and you get a 5% storage saving, it might be not a big deal. Even at 50%, you might not care. But once you get to like very large scale where those costs involved for those things start to actually add up, now you really do care. So this is what we see is the next kind of big step. This is a bit more longer term, is we want to set up like a working group of people who care about this, who want to make this change happen. And let's like figure out how to incorporate these ideas into the standards, into the like core uh, libraries that are on the ecosystem so that if you get them in the core libraries, this will percolate out into all the various other providers and tools that everyone else is building upon. And once they're there, you start to be able to get these benefits uh, for free. So, uh, Flox is trying to kind of create this working group. Again, reach out to us because I think this is really exciting. There's a lot of really cool possibilities. Let's uh, figure it out. Uh, we see you have proof of concepts, right? We have uh, PDT started working on this. This was done in Docker as well. We have experiments we're seeing all over the place of people playing with this idea. Let's take these proofs of concept and actually incorporate them and kind of take it to that next, next level. That's the uh, hope. Yeah, I mean that's what that's why Docker Docker Labs is interested in this, and um, yeah, I just want to I just want to thank you, Tom, for bringing your expertise to this. And uh, you know we've we've got one of the core Dix developers here, so uh, you know any anyone who's got got questions about this, I think uh, probably now's a good time, right? Yeah, um, I'll do a little bit of a, a pitch here, um, and this is what Flox is doing, right? We're trying to bring these superpowers of Nix, bring it to work, bring it to enterprise, leverage it. 
right? Build these integrations, right? If you don't integrate with other things, then you're kind of all alone. We want to increase our integration with the rest of the ecosystem so that uh, it becomes far more viable, far more useful, and in the end, uh, far more productive. So to wrap it up, uh, try Docker and Nix working together. Help us improve this integration and uh, join a working group. Thank you. All right, we got 15 seconds for, for our questions. <laughs> uh, I have a quick question. So I saw that for, for Docker, you kind of just uh, decoupled the build process and you made all of these uh, packages isolated. Is there a way where you can actually build all these packages concurrently so that the build time is much smaller than what it used to be? The, the overall build time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, like the, in some senses, like the build kit is an orchestrator, right? So why doesn't it take advantage of parallelization? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that is one of the things that we, that we would like to address with this because we have, we've got the pieces we need now to do a, uh, like every time we say the Nix is insanely cacheable, all, Nix is also insanely parallelizable. And, uh, and so, yes, I, 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 think, I think that's one of, that, that's one of the things where we, we see build kit Nix integrations as being potentially really powerful. Yeah, we, we calculate that, that graph ahead of time. And because you know what it is ahead of time, you can start to do a lot of parallel uh, work. Yeah. That's helpful. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's weird. It's lazy. Like, you know where the outputs are going to be before, like, you, get to, you can start depending on the outputs of things before they exist. Is that weird? I think that's weird. Yeah, so my phone died, so it's entirely possible that I, 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 can, I can intuit from the bit.ly URL you had at the end there that this is probably exactly what you did or what has been done. But given the insane cacheability that has men been mentioned, as well as the fact that you have non-overlapping layers, my immediate thought as somebody who works on container runtimes is we can dispense entirely with the layer blobs, right? So if you, do, if you have an uh, a image manifest, which is defined entirely in terms of cache Nix content instead of layer blobs, you don't even need those in the registry. You can have a snapshot or, or some uh, runtime implementation which natively understands yeah. those and populates the rootfs that defines the container entirely from the Nix store. Yeah. One of the example, one of the experiments that's out there right now is called Snapshotter. Well, and I, I saw that. Oh, you saw that? In okay, the, yeah. In the working group slide, which I assume is, uh, like I said, I wasn't able to get my phone up, but yeah, that Nix snapshotted. I assume that's probably a containerd snapshotter which natively understands Nix layers. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You've in, you've you have intuited that correctly. Yeah, yeah that, no, I was going to be uh, at the end here. I was going to go. So why don't you do this? But I, yeah, that, that's why I figure is that somebody had tried that. So yeah, yeah. Let's take this idea and then start to incorporate it. Right. Let's make it so that you don't have to go out of your way and be an expert to lever and benefit from this. Let's incorporate this kind of more tightly into the standards, into the run times, so you start to get it for free. Thanks, everyone. OK, thank you very much.